even. God is, he keeps, the more we seek him, the more we want him. Is a, is, we can never, seems like we can never get tired of his presence. <coughs> Oftentimes there's, there's such a need to just soak, soak in his presence. Encourage you in that quiet. We're, Carolyn was talking about the quiet. Sometimes the quiet up here is foreign to a lot of people. Um, if you're privileged to live on a quiet place or a quiet setting, what a blessing. And use that to your advantage to just to hear from the Lord. And so I'm, ta- I'm going to take us to a new uh, book in the Bible that we're going to just kind of start with this the next few weeks. I'm going to title this message, Off to a Good Start. And so the church of Thessalonica was the first Thessalonians. You could be looking for that if you'd like to, first chapter. It really was Paul's second uh, missionary trip. And he was a little bit anxious because he had to leave early. It would be like us having a child and then passing them off to someone else and not knowing if they will make it or not. And so that's kind of the feeling that Paul was going through. So he's looking forward to hearing back from Timothy, who will give a good report. And then Paul begins to send this letter back to them, encouraging them on even all the more. I know all of us from time to time need encouragement, right? We all, we all get sometimes, we get points to where we, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if we're making any difference. I don't know if I've, I'm qualified. And we come back and again and again to the Lord's word that he speaks to us that none of us are qualified, none of us are good enough, because, but because he is good enough, because he is qualified, because he is calling you and equipping you, he makes you good enough, he makes you qualified, he makes you what you ought to be, he gives to you when you oftentimes when you exactly need the strength, you have it. And that's the goodness of our God. And he comforts us so that we can comfort others in their trials as well. So the first couple of verses, Paul, uh, verse 1, and Silvanus, actually it means Silas, translated Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you. And I like how they didn't put titles on their churches in those days. They didn't have denominations. It's going to be kind of interesting in heaven where we're not going to have to worry about our denominations. Well, we're, we're, we belong to God. We're, we're from the church that we worship Jesus. And so Jesus is a denominational, he breaks through denominational barriers. I was with a friend, this, uh, a pastor friend here at the camp, and they, here's what they do. They have 23 churches in their community. This is in a Fergus Falls, if you know where that is. It's 20, it said 23 churches. I won't take the time to, to list them all. You can say thanks. <laughs> I couldn't if I wanted to. But what they've done the last several years is they have one, they do a celebration together. They, 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 they meet in the, in the, in the camp, in, like in the park, in the town. And so there'll be over 1,000 of them. And they'll have one service at least once a year where they celebrate together the name of Jesus. And they participate together. I thought that that's, a, that's one of the best things I've heard in a long time. How can we bring together communities? How can we bring together other brothers and sisters in the Lord? Too often we've kind of stayed to ourselves. Well, you're in that tribe. Oh, you're, that, you're, you're from that church. Oh, you're, you know what? Well, let's just bring the walls down. <laughs> We belong to God. We belong to the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's looking at every heart. And there are good people wherever you go. God is raising up true believers in every church. And so having said that, I'll move on to verse 2. I love how Paul often mentions, and I'll read this, he, he's always saying, we give thanks to God always for all of you. 
I need to practice that prayer. We need to pray for one another. Let me just say this is part of my message that we're kind of coming to. I need to be praying for you. You need to be praying for me. We need to be praying one for another. Why do we need to be praying for one another? Because Satan targets believers. Satan wants to discourage the saints. Satan wants to get the saints to fall asleep spiritually if he can. And so we ought to fight this battle. He said, I'm praying for you. Now, it doesn't say he goes into a long, lengthy prayer. I'm sure there were many names that he remembered, but I'm sure there were many names that he probably wasn't able to remember, but perhaps he could see their faces. Perhaps, like me, I'll remember where you sit, so then your name will come back to me, and then I'll begin to put the dots together, and then I'll, sometimes I'll walk to the sanctuary and say, so and so, you just sit here, just bless their life, fill them with goodness, overshadow them, be with them, and I'll say some sort of a prayer. But Paul says, I make mention. You know that God hears even one word prayers? Yes, he does. God receives all prayers when it's sincere, when it's transparent and open, when it's speaking or seeking for the things of God. He says, I make mention of you, and I, I don't know about you, but it's comforting to know that someone else is praying for a situation. When someone else says, I've been praying for you this week, or someone says, I've been praying for, your, for you at such and such a time. And I have a story that just kind of comes to me now, but there's this, this story, and I, I think my sister would maybe remember this person if she thinks about it, you remember Olga Bullis, and you remember her sister. I can't remember her name, but she was the one that passed away before. These are saints, pillars in the church of Palisade after it was started. This, this particular person had a burden to pray for her son-in-law, and she didn't know the reason. She just knew she was, he was in trouble. Son-in-law's name was Don. He was, uh, at one time in his life, he was in an automobile accident. He was thrown out of the vehicle, and he, he remembers laying and not being able to move. He remembers laying there and not being able to move. And all of a sudden, a warmth came through his body, and he was able to move. Well, it was the same time that her, his mother-in-law was praying in the spirit while she was actually mopping the floor on her hands and knees. And so what God was doing was using her to be an intercessor, and I believe God changed and turned the circumstances around because of someone that was obedient to prayer. If people's names come to you, there may be a reason. Lord, I don't know what's going on, but you know all things. You begin to pray and lift their names up in Jesus' name. If there's, a, if there's a need somewhere, somehow, maybe the Lord will bring it to you. Maybe the Lord won't. But the, the thing is to bring, bring and mention, God knows your name. God knows all people's names. God knows all people's situations at all times throughout the entire earth. That's because he's omnipresent. And that's because he's God. And now Paul is saying, verse 3, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love. Kind of thought about that phrase. Labor of love. You've heard that phrase. It's a labor of love you do. You wouldn't do it for no other reason is just simply because you want to follow the Lord and you want to please the Lord and you labor in love. Many of you do have done this. Many of you are doing this now by just being a person of servanthood, by just being a person that makes themselves available, that just helps out, that just constantly is looking for ways to encourage someone else on in their faith. So, so here we have a young church. Here we have a young group of believers. And Paul is saying to them, I'm bearing in mind, I remember. 
your attitude while I was there. I remember your work of faith. I remember that you guys reached out to your neighbors. I remember that you were giving to one another. I remember that when you didn't have much for yourselves, you still gave out of your need. That's what he's talking about, a labor of love. I remember how you didn't complain when you were asked to help in some way, your labor of love. Listen, God notices your work. God notices your work. Thank, I thank the Lord for examples in my life who have demonstrated a good work ethic. There's a balance in all this, but being mindful, the Lord speaks to this in First, or first Corinthians 15, 58. One of my first messages, if I recall, one of the first verses that I preached from and when I went to my first church in Palisade because they were down to about eight people and they've been hanging on for probably 30 plus years in a small community and they needed some encouragement. They needed to grow. And one of the verses that I recall preaching one was from this says this, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. How many have ever felt like all I ever do is work, but I never really know if I'm getting anywhere? And especially when it comes to kingdom work. Kingdom work, Jesus said, is like a mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? It's really as small as the top of a pin. But when it's planted, Jesus said it grows into a tree that's bigger than all the other trees in the garden. It says the birds come and even nest. The kingdom of God, oftentimes when we sow a seed, we don't see the result for a long, many times, long periods of time. I mean, oh, God is never really always not too often in a hurry like we are. Right? Or we're trying to get better at something. We're trying to get better at maybe our, our a hobby. Whatever that, how many have any hobbies? Do you have any hobbies? Don't say work is your, yeah, thank you, thank you. Don't say work is your hobby like me. But you, if you work at an instrument, or if you work at you work at you you want to make a different dish. You're trying to perfect it. You're trying to get better at it. You work at it, and eventually, all of a sudden, you you start to you feel like I don't know if I'm getting any better. But then all of a sudden, people start to recognize things are getting better, and they begin to encourage you. And what that makes you want to do is you want to you want to get better yet. And so the body of Christ is, is, is in such that we are meant for connecting together so that we can figure out what each other is going through so we can know better how to pray, but not only pray, but to walk together bearing each other's burdens, connecting. And so Paul is struggling with having to leave prematurely this young church. But God was merciful. God has been gracious. In spite of Paul, the church took off. See what I'm saying? In spite of sometimes we can't always be there. Sometimes your loved ones move halfway around the world, right? Or so to speak, you can't always see them. You can't always get to them. But you can pray. You can follow them. You can be close to God with you. You can bring their, you can mention their names in prayer. Because God's hand is not too short that he cannot save. His ear is not too dull that he cannot hear. He hears the cries. He cr Never underestimate the power of the prayers, of earnest prayers, prayers that go past uh, barriers, walls, countries, lands, uh, hang-ups, things that we, we can't do. And we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. 
This spiritual work is meant to be dealt with spiritual weaponry. And spiritual weaponry is the word of God and the prayers, earnest prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit that even uh, speaks to people in their quietness or even sometimes he makes himself known even as he did to Paul on the way as he was destroying the church, Jesus turned him around. Thanks be to God. I'm glad for that story. I'm glad for that testimony. People have been turned around and the power that of the gospel. Uh, verse 4, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. This is something I find a different way to look at things. You know, we have to choose Jesus. We, we know that. But look, look, who chose us first? The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, Jesus initiated the avenue in which we could choose him. Jesus initiates. Jesus sets the table. Jesus gives the invitation. Jesus makes a way for us so that we can be saved. He has chosen us. The scripture speaks to that fact that he has chosen us while we were yet sinners. Ephesians 1, 4 says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. It blows my mind to think that he would choose us before he created us, knowing that he would create mankind and they would need the Savior. That just, I have a hard time wrapping my my thinking around it, but for God so loved the world. And God came to save the sinners. Unbelievable. The Lord is so good. He chooses us. When we don't think we're good enough, he chooses us. When we don't see the potential and the progress, he chooses us. He chooses us even in our weaknesses. He chooses us when we don't feel like it. He chooses us because he's, he's, his blood has been shed for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He knew no sin. He came sin that we might know the righteousness of God in him. We are made complete. We are made righteous. Look on. For our gospel, verse 5, did not come to you in word only. How many of us can remember five sermons in the last, whatever, 10 years? That's okay, I can't either. I mean, I mean, I guess probably stir up something. But how many can think about five people, at least three, that have made a difference in your walk, have encouraged you? Think about three or four people, five, is, I'm sure you could come up with Several. What I'm saying is this. The gospel needs to be demonstrated. The gospel is proclaimed not only in public settings, but it needs to be proclaimed in the places where we work. And what I'm saying is oftentimes we proclaim the gospel by our attitude, by showing up on time, by doing a good job, because guess what? I don't just serve myself, I serve the Lord. In other words, this whole work thing, this work, that work of faith, that work of faith becomes work of faith because I now belong to Jesus. I, all that I do ought to honor his name. So then it's not me doing it, but it's he doing it through me and through you. You become his hands. You become his vessel. You become his instrument. And it gets fun. And it takes the pressure off. And you're not performing. He's performing through you. It's not your problem. It's God's problem. Right? You see how you transfer? You're praying. You're believing. You're trusting. But your kids ultimately belong to God, your caretakers, your stewards, your managers. But now we're, we're saying, oh, Lord, you love them more than even I do. 
and I'm going to trust you. He's chosen us. He's chosen us to belong to him. He's chosen us, 1 Peter 2.9, to be a royal priesthood. This is an unbelievable scripture when you think about it. A royal priesthood. Now, in the Old Testament, we, we've learned this recently in Exodus, that the Levites, they were the chosen, they were the people that did, they were the only guys who could handle the sacrifices. They were the only people that God said, you can come into my presence. But Jesus made a way for us all to become priests. What that means is we can all become, we, be, we can all come into his presence. We can all represent people that are bringing things to God, that are lifting, that are interceding, that are going before. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let me ask this question. Who might you know that is reading your life? Who might you know that is watching you? Sometimes we don't really realize it. That people are observing us, watching us. Not to put us in the spotlight, but you know what? I have a responsibility. God has given, trusted me. God has trusted me with a job. God has trusted me with a community. God has trusted me with, with my children. God has trusted me to maybe where I, where I go to school. God is trusting me with the gospel. He's calling us to be an ambassador, to go into other even nations. Some of us are called beyond. Some of us are called to stay. And I love that Old Testament story with David's men. Some of them were weary at one time, and the other guys went off to battle. But these guys... David says, you guys, it's okay. You can stay here and guard the stuff, guard the baggage, okay? Now, the men that went out to war came back and said, what? what? They are, they're going to get they're gonna get in on the spoil. What do you mean? They didn't do anything. What David says, it's just as much. They're going to get just as much. You know what that's saying to us? When you pray for a missionary, when you pray for... People in your neighborhood, you're going to get in on the reward. You're going to get in on the blessings that God has for the faithfulness. God needs people behind the scenes. God needs people on the front lines. God needs people in between. God needs people every place. Someone said, you can always tell a Norwegian, but you can't tell them much. Yep, right? You've heard that? Well, I'm one of them. That's just a joke. But what I'm saying is this. You may be able to relate to someone else better than me. And that's absolutely wonderful. I believe that the reason we have had these different denominations is because it's obviously different sets of beliefs. But sometimes God has, you know, he has the best fit for us. And Jesus, his, his words is, in Corinthians says that God puts and he places the members as he see fit. And sometimes we say, Lord, where can I best be put? Where do you want me to be? Where is the place you're calling? Where is the body of Christ you want me to connect? And then from there, its ultimate goal is to branch out, reach the unbelievers, reach those that are sort of maybe on a, on a two or three in a scale of ten. Maybe there's, there's seed there, but it needs a little watering, a little to cultivate, a little encouragement. Maybe there's some, some need for a little salt, just a little, just encourage someone that Carrie will say this put a salt tablet. You can't lead a horse to water and make him drink, but you can put a salt tablet. What she's saying is you can encourage them to make maybe make something to chew on, something to think about. Encourage them. Love them. When I think about the work that it takes, I think about people who labored before me. I think about former pastors. I think about former lay leaders in the church. I think about uh, Sunday school teachers who were, who were faithful. 
I think about kids work. I think about people who brought the Kool-Aid. I think about people who brought the, 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 the salads. I think about people who cleaned up after. I think of all these things it takes to make the church a family. Thank you, Carrie, for all the work at the nursery at camp, coordinating and all. Thank you. I'm sure you're thankful for all the helpers. So I started I think, thinking about, thank you. I can start listing people that are helping this body. It's a beautiful thing. I'm appreciative. Sandy, you do the books. Cal's on the board. Joe's on the board. And these guys have done assignments for Cal has helped coordinate, get the water sprinkling and going just lately. That was something that just, that just hasn't been happening. Thank you, Cal. Vern, you're stepping in and teaching. It, it's just a blessing. What I'm saying is that it takes a team. It takes people. And we want people to belong and re reside together, work together. And we'll back up and we'll, we'll top it off with this. God gives the increase. God is, verse 3, constantly bearing, Paul is saying, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, your labor. Your labor is not in vain. In fact, Galatians says that, Del, grow weary, you finish it. In doing good. Don't be weary in well-doing. It's going to pay off. And you know what it says also? Especially to the saints. So why do the saints need ministering to? So that the saints can stay strong and keep an edge and be built up. Because when you go back to the workplace Monday or into your schedules next week, no doubt there's going to be things. You don't plan on things that are negative happening, but life happens, right? You don't plan on stuff, but we're going to be tested at times. God, God works through all that. We need to be praying one for another. And I wonder if here today, if we could do something that would say, you know what, I, I, I want to I wanna, I wanna take your name before the Lord today. I, I want to take your name before the, you know, the throne room today, this week. And you, you, that's between you and the Lord. And you can remember a person maybe sitting next to you or sitting in this place or not here even today that you want to lift up in the name of Jesus. Because that's what Paul, I will make mention of you, of you. I will think about what you're going through. We're going to sing a song and close. But let's just begin to pray for a bit before we sing uh, just a moment or two here. And just we open our hearts right now, Jesus. Right now we open our hearts to. There, there are peoples. Maybe there's somebody that's even across from our place, our living quarters, or communities. Or I even mean, there's a person in our family member that we know they're they're struggling. They're going through things. And we just hold them up to you. And I pray that this would be a habit that we could form. That so we would be quick to be praying for others before we pray for ourselves. That we lift up one another. And so in the name of Jesus today, help us. That, let that be something that would carry us out. And that we would think about others more than ourselves and be reminded of the wonderful faith and the wonderful hope. And so cover us now in Jesus' name. Amen.